Hello and welcome everybody. It's always nice to see everybody's face on here and um, it, it seems like we've got a really good mix of people from, um, from all over, all different continents. So this is always really wonderful to see. Um, so yes, let me get started. Welcome everyone to Maternal and Infant Health Canada's Education Webinar Series. Today we are joined by Dr. Bridget Malawesi to discuss the topic, Women and Health in Malawi, Improving Maternity Care in Health Centers Using Quality Improvement Processes. Most of you, actually I'm not sure if most of you have joined in before. Um, some Definitely some new faces and um, some who have come back before. So for those of you who are new, uh, here's a little bit about MyCan. We are a global public health collaborative working to improve the health of women and children around the world while seeking equity-driven solutions to a more sustainable world. We do this through education, research, and innovation. We are comprised of doctors, researchers, public health professionals, and traditional medicine practitioners from around the globe. If you would like to learn more about our work or contribute in any way, please email us. I have put all of our contact information in the chat box. So you can email us at mycancares at gmail.com or follow our Facebook page, Maternal Infant Health Canada. Um, we have added to the chat, or I've added all that to the chat box. And then I think we've also got uh, Instagram and I believe even, even uh, we've got Twitter and maybe even um, uh, TikTok. No, I'm not sure. Did we end up getting a TikTok, Farah? Much. or not quite yet. Um, okay, so as with all of our public webinars, I have to add the following disclaimer. This course and handouts may contain general information about medical uh, conditions and treatments. The information is not advice and should not be treated as such. Um, if you have questions during the webinar, please write them in the comment box um, at the bottom or side of the screen, depending on what device you're tuning in on. And what we'll do is we'll capture the questions and then ask them at the end of the lecture portion. And then that way we can get a bit of a conversation going. We really do want everybody to be um, engaging. So don't be shy about asking questions. We're really, that's one of the best parts about these webinars is the conversations that come from them. Um, uh, I am your moderator. My name is Dr. Emily Solomons. I'm a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine and a MyCan team lead. I'm zooming in from the ancestral and unceded lands of the Coast Salish people, also known as New Westminster, BC. We also have Dr. Farah Shroff, who is the founder and lead of Maternal and Infant Health Canada and a Takemi fellow at Harvard University. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Bridget Malawesi, and she is a medical doctor, a public health practitioner, motivational speaker, activist, and health columnist, a graduate of the College of Medicine, the University of Malawi, and Emory University, Atlanta, USA, where she did a master's in public health with a focus on global health. She is currently a visiting scientist um, and Harvard lead fellow in the Department of Global Health and Populations at the Harvard T.H. Chan School and Harvard Global Health Institute. She's also the vice president of the Malawi chapter of Women in Global Health. Um, so without further ado, I am going to pass this over to you, Dr. Malawesi. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Emily, and thank you so much, Farah. Um, actually, the, um, the opportunity to present today um, was um, because Farah attended one of our sessions from the lead fellowship, so I really appreciate um, the opportunity and the connection. Um, and just to say what I'll be presenting today is um, part of a um, project that we were conducting for a previous uh, fellowship that I was, I was part of um, under the Karolinska Institute, and I see Joanna Bloomberg from the team is also joining the um, the session today so that's um, just to call out that her as well and thank her for the opportunity so um I'll just share my screen hold on somehow I must have closed the PowerPoint but hold on um, okay and I'm I'm, I'm uh, speaking to you 
um, 30 minutes from home because I was in transit. I was traveling with my, um, with, I'd taken my, my nieces and nephews and my, do- my children to visit my mom. Um, so it's a six hour drive. So we've just, we're just 30 minutes out from home. So I'm standing somewhere, but hopefully the power will stay on. But um, thank you so much for having me. This was part of um, a leadership training um, that we were, a fellowship that we were part of. So I'm presenting um, the results of a group of us that were part of this. We were part of the Malawi cohort. It's a uh, fellowship that was um, um, in a couple of countries, Malawi, um, Ethiopia, and well as Kenya. And um, our cohort was doing this quality improvement process. Um, it was a group of us and the, real, the fellowship is really looking at improving the leadership of public health um, officials. Um, and also in terms of bringing together a multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral um, teams. So we were a team of doctors and nurses really midwifery and focusing on improving midwifery care and maternity care as well. So um, I think what Farah asked us to, asked me to present I know mainly I do what I do now is mostly focused on women's leadership and role in healthcare. So um, as she mentioned, I'm I'm doing the work in women's global health um, as well as women doctors associations. Okay, so the presentation itself, um, I'll give a bit of background of uh, Malawi. Um, as I said, I'm in Lilongwe, Malawi, which is the capital city of Malawi, and then um, just a little bit of background in terms of the project that we conducted um, last year, and just sharing about the process as well as the activities that we conducted and then the lessons learned through that process as well. Um, So Malawi is known as the warm heart of Africa. It's in the sub-Saharan region. um, And uh, most people don't really know where we are, but I often say we're like, most people will probably know Tanzania, Mozambique or Zambia. So those are the yellow, green and purple colors. And we're a landlocked country right in the middle of all those country of those three countries. Um, We're a small nation. Um, Our population is approximately 18 million. um, And what I'm showing there is our lake, which is known as the 365 lake um um, it's the the calendar lake because it's 365 kilometers long and 52 kilometers wide um and um quite one of our tourist attractions so really um always exciting if you ever end up on this end of the world um definitely do make some time to visit our lake um and um just a little bit uh, about our country as well um as i said our population is about now 19.3 million um um with a like 51.5 percent female um but a very young population as you can see 51 percent of the population is also under the ages of 15. Um, majority of people live in the rural areas um and our life expectancy right now is 63.7 um, and this has risen in the past 20 years it was around 37 in around 2000 and so so there's some improvement especially with uh, provision of hiv treatment and other improvements for child and immuni- um, child immunization and other factors so um although it's relatively low compared to the western setting it's still like an improvement for our end um and I think one of the we, uh, you know, we we're heavily donor dependent, um, something that actually has come up quite predominantly this week as well in terms of the social media, in terms of our health expenditure. um, And a lot of that then dominates because a lot of the funding goes straight into programmatic work from donors. 61.6% of our budget is donor funded. Um, And just uh, in terms of that rural population, uh, most people about a quarter of our population still lives uh, more than eight kilometers out from a health facility. That, that means that they most likely have to walk um, because they, most, they will not likely have any car or any bicycle or something like that. So this is the context that is we're living in. As I mentioned, I live in the capital city, Lilongwe. Our official language is Achichewa and um, English, but we have a multitude, I think over 12 other official language, like languages, um, different tribes across the, the regions, depending on where you're based. So, um oops. okay okay so about the um the project that we conducted sorry i must have pressed too many times um 
So as I said, the project that we were conducting was part of a um, the fellowship that we were under the Karolinska Institute from Sweden, um, and it was a, co a coordination between various public health in um, individuals in the health sector in Malawi, with a strong affiliation to the nursing school, then the Kamuzu College of Nursing, which has now merged with the medical school and now called KUHES, but at that time it was Kamuzu College of Nursing. So we had a number of participants from the College of Nursing, myself as a medical doctor and a colleague as well, who was based in the Ministry of Health. Um, so that was the the quality improvement team. We had a process of um, some classes and some lessons as then well as then implementing a quality improvement project, which was really looking at improving the services of maternity delivery in a health facility setting. So the process that we did, as I mentioned, we started with the capacity building program, which were the lessons, and then um, trying to then figure out how to fit within the structure of the health facility. So we had to identify a health facility and then look at team building, um, as well as then for identifying key interventions that we could implement in that facility. And for that, that and for this project, we focused on um, the delivery period, specifically around skills for um, flexible sacrum positioning, as well as delayed cold camping and skin to skin and early base feeding. And we did some assessments of the intervention, both what was happening at the facility before um, the intervention, as well as after the team building and um, skills building, and then trying to follow up in terms of what was going on after that intervention. The intervention itself, so we started the training in September for ourselves as the leadership team or the quality improvement team, but then into um, the actual intervention was done um, from around January to March of 2020, uh, 21. So, well, and we started planning around January, eventually implemented around March and then completed around June. So it was a short period. Um, it was also last year. So as you can imagine, it was COVID era. Um, we had, I think at that time we were experiencing our second wave of COVID. So that delayed a number of factors. Um, and so that also um, impacted on the duration through which we could implement the project. Um, so we we were as we selected a health facility, so it was a, a health center and the structure of the Malawian health sector is that we have um, a four stage um, system, you have community um, level which is usually like um, whether it's in the village, they has like village or health clinics or, you know, sort of community health workers. Mm -hmm. And then from there you get to the health center level, which is the primary facility. So this project was being um, conducted at the primary facility from which then they would, if there was any complication would refer to a district hospital. Um, and then Blantyre district is an urban. So it's in the Southern region of the country and also has a tertiary um, hospital. Um, Blantyre is unique in that they, the district hospital is also the tertiary institution so they are actually the same the same hospital, but in other districts you will have a separation, especially in some of the cities. Um, so this health center is known as Limby Health Center. It's an urban um, or relative peri urban or urban center. It's right in the heart of the city. Um, it's a labor ward that was led by midwives. Um, they had two midwives per shift. Um, they had about 15 deliveries uh, per day. Uh, so it's quite a busy labor ward um, compared to other labor wards in the country. Um, it is was chosen specifically because um, as we said, we were collaborating specifically through the Kamuzu College of Nursing, which is a nursing school, and it was close to the campus, so it was possible for us to engage and um, travel there for um, supervision as well as support during the implementation of the project. Um, and it also was a teaching facility for um, students, both nursing and other clinical um, students, so it will also provided that opportunity to have other um, apart from the staff of the facility would be able to engage other students um, and others uh, for this intervention. And the leadership of the institution itself was interested and we were hoping to engage all of those. So the process involved us engaging both at the district level to get the permission and then the leadership of the institution which they provided to carry out the intervention. Okay, I'm realizing if I click too fast, it, it moves ahead too fast. Okay, um, so as mentioned, um, we did some pre, um, well, I knew it would move. <laughs> when you're controlling somebody else's laptop. Um, so um, in terms of the planning, as I mentioned, um, we sought permission from the Blantyre District Hospital. So each we Malawi has um, 29 health districts. Blantyre is one of them. Um, it is has a population of about, 
two, if not now three million people. And the so we had to seek permission from the district health office. Um, we also planned to have some sessions in the skills lab of the college of the nursing college, um, and as well as well um, um, engaging with the students and um, then having some sessions with the team that we were doing the capacity training on the on zoom as well as supporting for staff um, and then we had a number of interventions using sort of a pdsa cycle um, we uh, pre-tested a number of um of 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 the tools that we created um, in collaboration with the ki uh, facilitation team um, and then implemented um, during the during the during the months that I mentioned, um, and then we had, as I mentioned, we, se we selected this facility because it was it was easy it was easily accessible to the staff. So we also conducted supporting visits to the facility every week after the trainings. We only conducted two trainings, as I mentioned, it was during um, the time we had our second wave of COVID, so that impacted on in person sessions and the ability to bring together groups of staff together. So although obviously the services were still running, but they were also running a very light, um, low um, sort of resource um, personnel in, 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 in at the facility. So that impacted on the number of people that could be engaged. Um, but we, we did and engage those and then eventually um, conducted some training sessions as well as the follow-up visits that were conducted with the rest of the team, mainly the team from the nursing school because they were um, close by. Ah, okay. So the key outcomes that we were looking for in this project, as I mentioned, we were looking at three elements, um, the dynamic flexible position, um, delayed cord clamping, as well as skin to skin care, and really looking at outcomes in terms of proportion of women who were delivering using the flexible sacrum position, um, and whether they were satisfied with delivering in the flexible um, sacrum position, um, looking at um, proportion of um, health providers practicing delayed cord clamping, as well as any um, who were, and the, the number that we were observing and um, providing um, delayed cord clamping and then looking at skin to skin care. So during our pre-assessment finding, as I said, there were sort of two interventions. There was one which was team building, um, trying to understand how the team functions, as well as then um, trying to build some skills, the skills specifically around um, how to, uh, do the three interventions that we were we were focused on. So in terms of team building, as I mentioned, it was a midwifery led, um, it was a ward that was um, run by the midwives with some clinical support. Um, it was also an interesting site because it was going to be um, a site that was going to become a midwifery led ward. So that was also part of the reason we selected that site as well. And it was a little bit, um, they didn't have a specific team leader, was not as coordinated as it could be. And so those were some of the elements that we were working with them as well in terms of team building to try and um, engage the team to have more structure that's more coordinated. And we we assessed this using tools. So we had some surveys of the members in the team, trying to understand what they do know, their knowledge, as well as their practices in the facility. Um, in terms of um, delayed cord clamping, uh, most of the midwives had knowledge of delayed cord clamping from um, um, trainings that had happened uh, for helping babies breathe is a big project in in Blanta as well as the nation as the country. So I think most of them had had some of those trainings, understanding delayed cord clampings, as well as from the data collection um, HMIS trainings. So most of them did know of um, delayed cord clamping, um, but most of them didn't practice it correctly or weren't practicing it as it should be. Um, in terms of skin to skin attachment, um, they were doing the attachment, but for a short time. So I think that would, you know, once the delivery was conducted, they would um, do some attachment, but then often would remove the baby um, quite quickly. So that was what we noticed during the pre-assessment period. Mm -hmm. And then um, when we were observing the students, as we mentioned that this facility was also a facility where students were rotating through for their midwifery attachments. Um, what we noted was that um, that uh, that some of the, although the initiatives were available in the curriculum itself, but most of the students weren't practicing it um, when they were at the facility level. So it wasn't the training, but not necessarily being practiced um, when it came to their practical sessions. So we conducted a training um, for 
um, the staff for the three initiatives, um, including a PowerPoint that was developed by the um, KI team, um, as well as utilized in some of the other participating countries. Um, so in that, we have myself um, uh, at the background there writing, and then um, Dr. Likako presenting. He was actually a really great resource. He's also He was also part of, at that time, he was the director of quality improvement. Um, so uh, in the Ministry of Health. Um, so he was like a really great resource for this project because he was really, um, you know, sort of involved and in, at a national level and then helping us in, implement at this sort of small scale urban um, health center level. Um, and we we shared, apart from the presentations and the training, really trying to hear from them in terms of their experiences from previous, uh, from traditional birth attendants, just trying to hear from them experiences and understanding that most women were actually delivering, lying down, um, but that they didn't, they'd heard from some of the traditional birth attendants that women would want to practice some of the uh, flexible sacral positions. Um, we had some videos that were available as well in terms of showing and demonstrating how this could be conducted. Um, we had planned to conduct skills training um, so that we would take the staff from the facility to the school, the nursing school, to practice um, in the skills lab because that would have been a very helpful exercise for them as well. But this was not done. Again, as we mentioned, this was during the COVID pandemic. And so there were restrictions in terms of access to the nursing school as well. Um, but overall, what we found was that the staff were enthusiastic about implementation of the three initiatives and really engaged in terms of trying to learn and see how they can improve both for their own skills but also for the service satisfaction of women um, attending their facility. Um, so, and these are sort of, we didn't do a sort of very deep analysis of our results per se, um, but what we did was then analyze the um, sort of the interventions post um, the trainings and how that was going. So it was followed up for a period of um, 12 weeks, three month period. Um, and again, um, this is, you know, with some supervision by the by our team coming in every week to check in and provide any super, su supportive supervision as well as practical um, implementation support. So looking at that, and I know it's a lot of different bars, but basically just looking over the 12 week period, um, we had started in week one post training. Um, the first sort of the light blue is the flexible sacrum position. The second bar is the sort of green or like a turquoise, I don't know, turquoise um, would be the um, de delayed cord clamping and then um, the the skin to skin um, initiating and then the first is the total number of deliveries. So these are absolute numbers, not percentages. Um, and I guess you could see that over time, I think especially with the supportive vision that the numbers of people being offered any of in the interventions was increasing at, um, in proportion to the number of deliveries. So you can see in week one, um, no one was offered flexible sacrum position. Um, and you know there was some delayed cold camping and skin to skin initiation, which was already in existence in the facility. So I guess, as I mentioned, it wasn't just being practiced properly. Um, uh, but you can see that um, in week two onwards, we're seeing more um, um, opportunities for offering flexible sacrum positions um, up to the end of the 12 week period um, and it varied across the site. And I think sometimes that also reflected on the comfortability of the of the of the staff in providing some of these, especially the flex, flexible sacral positionings. Um, I think you can see that that's the one that sort of lagged behind because that's the one that wasn't often provided to um, women, whereas the others, the delayed cord clamping and the skin to skin was something that they had already been practicing um, overall. So the orange bar is the total number of deliveries and then the other bars are like the proportion towards to all the um, uh, number of births that was conducted. So those are qualitatively, um, in terms of the quotations that we heard from the midwives, um, they were, there was some, you know, for first participant, I think there was some concerns about um, the ability to support the perineum. Um, I think that's what was, most of them were concerned about, even during the training, I think this came out quite strongly that they had heard that the, you know, the benefits, some of the benefits of the flexible sacral positions, but that they were nervous about how, um, sometimes they did get quite severe um, sort of tears and those were what was most scary to them. And so they were not, um, they were hesitant. And I think, as you can see, that's why we took a little bit of a time to get some of them comfortable towards the end. You could see that 
quite a number of women are offered the sacral positionings, um, but most women, most of the staff took a little bit of time to get um, um, to that level of comfort. Um, but as you can see, participant number two um, indicated after five weeks, I'm confident to assist women in flexible positions, but there's need for more training. And I think we saw this and probably as we, we um, indicated, we only were able to conduct four trainings at the facility and then provide some on-site um, supportive visits. We didn't conduct the skills training, which I think would have been very helpful. And although we provided the videos for them to watch, I think there was a little bit more um, that they wanted to learn or do um, during that time. Um, and then I think one of the things that we did realize, because again, we were doing this as part of the sort of a project um, during our training, but there was a desire to um, receive resources um, so that they have more space and adjustable beds um, and birthing chairs um, as they had seen in the videos, because I think that that's, that would have been also helpful for them, um, the staff to provide that kind of level of care um, in a, to give them more sort of comfort in providing that kind of care. So um, during the process, because we had to um, internally for ourselves, I think we, we also realized that there was um, a, a good collaboration because as we mentioned, there was ourselves from, um, you know, I was coming in from a policy perspective as well as for my colleague um, who was coming from the quality improvement um, department. Um, we certainly had the academic team, which was mainly from the College of Nursing and then the clinical staff. So I think even in terms of collaborating across the different spectrum from clinical research um, as well as academic and, and then policy implementation, um, it was very help to, helpful to have that collaboration and working together. Um, and I think that this also complemented what was in existence in terms of our strategies in country, in terms of respectful maternity care and providing women more options for what, um, you know, I think sometimes women, um, as, as we saw in that facility, while they were able to do like, for example, delayed cord clamping and attachment, but sometimes it was quickly, um, you know, sort of not practiced correctly, but also what we saw was that they weren't offered any, um, you know, sort of various variety of options. So that the, this enriched, I think, the ability of this facility to be able to provide a wider range of of options for women um, in the facility. Um, and this also provided an opportunity for trainings um, on CPD for the staff at the facility. Um, and also provided for us as a team in terms of networking and collaboration. Um, and um, I think even in terms of what we saw was that even though we were implementing for a short period of time, that there was some impact. And I think we heard that from some of the members of the staff at that facility, how they found that it was helpful, um, you know, and even the feedback from some of their clients in terms of um, being offered those kind of options um, was, was something that they appreciated. Um, <clears throat> so I think some of this, um, in terms of beyond the level of this facility, looking at how that impacts on, for example, the curriculum, as we said that the curriculum does contain all of these elements already, but maybe really looking at when it comes to the practical um, implementation, having a facility where students can visit and be able to practice and see staff practicing, because I think that was the challenge. Um, as we mentioned, this facility was somewhere where students would do their practicals, but if no one, none of the staff on, on site are uh, conducting, they will probably not be you know, sort of doing the right practical elements as well. So they would miss out on that element. So I think this is helpful in terms of the curriculum for the midwifery courses, um, but also in terms of providing the facility with a wider range of um, options providing to their staff, and then really looking at beyond that satisfaction of, 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 of the clientele, um, respectful maternity care, something that was being um, promoted through this approach um, and really looking at um, neonatal outcomes as something else that could also be, we didn't measure it specifically, but we anticipate that that had some level of impact, at least even at, at the, uh, in the initial onset. Mm. Okay. Um, so we did highlight some of the challenges that I did um, um, highlight COVID-19 was obviously a really challenging, uh, a key challenge during implementation of this project. I think we could have run longer um, and done more um, during the time that we had for this training and in terms of implementation, it delayed trainings, it delayed the ability for students to actually be on site to support this project. Um, so that was something that um, was a challenge for us. Um, and there was also, I think, some of the things that we noted was that um, in terms of budgeting, I think there were some things that we just 
didn't account for, but they were required, you know, so conducting these trainings would require some resources like lunch, providing lunch for the participants, for example, was something that we didn't have. Um, and um, during um, our time there, uh, we didn't have students which we had wanted to because although it is a training facility, but because Long, um, Limby was a um, um, uh, sort of a, a hotspot for COVID-19 and was a, a treatment center for a bit of time as well. So that diverted um, the students' participation. But overall, I think there were some things that we were able to do even in the short period of time that we had at the facility. Um, and I think we were, we did recommend that although because at the think the time after the three months we were completing the project specifically so while we had the initial outcomes we would have loved to be able to engage further. Um, I am aware and um, I think that was something that was exciting to see. Um, I think six months down the line they did open a very specific midwifery led ward. Um, in that facility where they did have the resources. I think you saw one of the participants, in, um, one of the staff, staff was highlighting that um, the resources were a limitation. So that also is a, you know, sort of coming from that recommendation and seeing that happen, I think was a good thing to see that then they did get the resources required to try and implement some of this beyond, not just related to this project, but beyond um, in terms of their maternity care. Um, and so it's also an, an ongoing project in terms of improving um, the midwifery model of care where midwives would lead in the facility. Um, and then also um, really thinking through how the participants from um, the health facility would be involved further in, in developing this into a sort of something more um, large scale. So, um, as I mentioned, it was a multidisciplinary team um, with um, some key members from the Co College of Nursing, so lecturers um, and midwives who were really pivotal and critical in terms of um, leading the super supportive supervision as well as really directing um, and supporting any students that would have appeared there. Um, there was myself at that time, I was affiliated um, with Seed Global Health and Dr. Andrew Likaka. And then we were, our coordinator was also a lecturer from Kungsu College of Nursing, um, Dr. Alice Kadango. And then we had um, our, our group lead as well as an other members from Karolinska Institute who were supporting us on various elements of the project. Um, and in terms of our acknowledgements, um, definitely to thank all the staff and clients from the health center. They were very welcoming and open to this initiative, even though it was a short duration, but they were very um, keen and really moved along and, and, and even beyond the existence of the project were really um, pivotal and really pulling through and, and doing um, the interventions as proposed. Um, definitely from the Blantai District Office, as we mentioned that Limby Health Center is a small a health center within the Blantai District. So we did have to seek permission from them and it was very helpful for the Blantai District Office to direct us and also give guidance in terms of prioritizing which facility we can use and why. Um, from the Ministry of Health, from Karolinska, um, from Kaluz, Kaluz College of Nursing and all sort of other participants in the initiative as may be. Yeah, so that's all I have to share. Looking forward to hearing your questions and comments. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. That was very fabulous. It was really um, wonderful to be able to, to see what, what you've been doing and your amazing team um, and, and just seeing you know what, where the struggles were and where it was easier to implement. Uh, we do have a couple of questions already. So sure. um, yeah, you had mentioned that there was some, some mid, midwife involvement. Shilpa had asked, um, hello, um, I would like to know more about how midwifery led practices could be integrated within the health facilities. Um, resistance from staff, that was, uh, so I, I imagine, you know, like, is there a lot of resistance from, from staff um, with the other midwifery led practices? Um, so what we saw, and I think, um, as I mentioned, this facility specifically is actually implementing a project which is looking to model midwifery care in country. We know that a lot of the midwifery 
wards or the labor wards are run by midwives, but um, you know, often there is, um, and at, at the like, for example, at the health center level, they will not they will not likely have a doctor per se, but they will have a clinician who is a clinical officer or a medical assistant. So the closest would be like a physician assistant in the sort of Western health um, structure, um, and they usually are. Uh, called upon to support when needed. Um, but I think that what we've seen is that because of, again, it's, this is why the, the program itself was set up this way to try and create a multidisciplinary team that can show some collaboration between the two teams and show that midwives can run the ward and only, and only if there was a need for urgent care to come in to call in a clinician, for example. So it's something that, um, you know, I think it's, it's being encouraged. It definitely, like for example, part of the reason why the midwifery-led model is being promoted is to understand that the way that the midwives are trained and you know in the curriculum is shows gives them a, a wide scope of of practice. But when it comes down to the actual delivery, um, they they sort of get limited in terms of how things are structured. So part of the reason why this model um, was being created, and even in terms of this initiative, was to try and see how well the team can work together, how coordinated, and even be able to provide wider range of options that that midwives actually do know to provide um, and that will, would also um, improve on some of the outcomes and then reduce on some of the negative um, impacts and outcomes that would require clinical intervention by a doctor or a clinician. So it's, it's, it's um, the reality and again I, I obviously come at, at it from a I'm a medical doctor um, but I think they you know and I unfortunately we don't have the rest of the midwives uh, from the team here I've seen Joanna has dropped off as well but um, I you know it, it was it was something that was um, you know a, an open conversation around how do we promote this um, and I think it's it's a work in progress it's definitely not you know sort of solved at all and certainly we are doing we were doing this at a at an urban health center and hope, hoping to see that it would grow to a level where um, you know it would be scaled up to other facilities, including the, the district hospitals and the bigger hospitals, for example. Thank you. Um uh Shilpa, did uh here I can ask let you unmute if you'd like to um add anything else to that. Um, and just so everybody knows, uh, put your cameras on. This, it's a great time to be able to see everybody's faces. So did that answer your question? Hi, yes. Shilpa. Hi, I'm sorry because of the poor bandwidth. I couldn't put my video on for a long time. I, I'll just put it on for a minute and then probably I'll switch it off. Thank you so much. It does answer my question. Uh, I'm asking this because we are also planning to probably start um, um, an initiative similar to this. So wanted to know more about the time that takes um, for integration of such practices within the existing health system and uh, uh, whether it changes when it, when it goes to higher health facilities for district level, for example, when you have more complicated and high risk cases and uh, the midwifery led practices or the midwifery led uh, ward concept could be more difficult when there is a high burden of the high risk cases. So do you experience any such thing or do you anticipate more challenges when it goes to a higher level referral hospital? Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, I'm not directly involved with the midwifery led ward now, but I could try and get their links to you. I think I know I'm still in touch with some of the members who are leading that. Um, actually, originally we were planning because I was part of the team that was um, in, in the initial planning stage for the midwifery led ward. Um, we had initially planned to host it at the um, district hospital, the tertiary institution, um, looking at part of what were the challenge they had was that although they're meant to be receiving high risk cases at the hospital, there was still a lot of like low risk cases that were coming through. So the idea was to channel those low risk cases in that same facility to the midwifery led ward and then only the high risk ones would go to the one to the ward which would be um, sort of manned or supported by the clinicians. Um, unfortunately again because of COVID um, that the section that had been um, lined up for becoming the midwifery led ward became the maternity um, COVID ward mm -hmm. so that's how this um, model ward ended up coming to a, an urban health center. 
Um, but I think that there's definitely lessons to be learned even at the health, urban health center. And the reason why um, it was put at the, at the health center was because the majority of cases that they're meant to be seeing at the urban health center are meant to be those low risk cases, which should be within the purview of a midwife. And therefore, um, again, um, looking at what the mandate of what a midwife should be able to handle, this was why this facility was seen to be fine. And then we would look at, again, sort of seeing what the scale up would look like. But I would be happy, and I think um, Farah and the team could certainly connect you with me, and I could be happy to connect you to the team that is running the midwifery led ward because they're. I think they're now running like it's been running for a year, so it would be helpful to hear what what lessons they've learned because I did I'm not as involved now beyond the project. <clears throat> Thank you so much. That would be helpful. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so talking about connecting and everybody connecting before we go to the next question, um, for those of you who are not already on our email list, or if you want to be connected to um, and be able to watch some of the, the next webinars that we have, you're welcome to either send an email to mycancares at gmail, or you can just private uh, chat your um, WhatsApp contact or your email to either far or or I right now, and we'll capture that, and then we can add you to the um, mail out list when when we have another webinar that comes out, um, and and then we can be in contact. Or if you have something that you would like to share with the group, a presentation, you can also reach out about that. So yeah, feel free to just uh, send a little message in the chat, and then we'll just capture your your contact information for future future reference and and future webinars. So um, Henry Henri or Henry Mark. Um, has a question. Would um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll get you. I'll ask you to unmute if you'd like to ask the question in person. Let's see. Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, oh, there we go. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, and thank you, Bridget, for the great presentation. Um, so the question I asked in the chat is um, about ma maintaining the momentum. You know, most of the times we go out do these brilliant projects. And after we've left, um, they are just put back in the show. Um, and so uh, are there any things you try to do to see that the practice continues? Because remember I said these midwives uh, or health workers knew what to do, but they were not doing it. Then the second question is um, just a short one, whether you did a needs assessment prior to um, going out to do this work in that particular facility for them to appreciate the intervention that we had brought. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, and thank you for, so much for that question. I think those are really important questions when we're doing these policy initiative, uh, initiatives. So just to start from the first question that you asked, I think, as you saw, we outlined some of the reasons why we picked the facility itself. One was because it was already um, aligned to the Kamuzu College of Nursing. So as we mentioned, this was um, a, a joint project with policy um, policymakers, academicians, as well as um, KI. And part of the reason this facility was initially was selected was because it was already a site and a facility that the um, the staff, the nursing academic staff, and students would be visiting. So part of building into that process of um, being able to have that sustainability was the, the understanding that um, again this was going to be a facility where ongoing visits would happen. Again, that's why there was that linkage to the curriculum in terms of being able to link it to is are these the things that they're being taught in the curriculum and then are they happening at the facility level and therefore hopefully that that would beyond sort of the existence of this small project having an already existing partnership that exists beyond that would be something that would help sustain and I think um, again I, I, as unfortunate that obviously I'm presenting a year after so then it would have been helpful to provide like what are the current updates but I think even in terms of um, choosing a facility like I said where there was going to be this midwifery led model to be implemented was also part of that sustainability in terms of that beyond having started that kind of initiative having been engaged in this sort of these are some of the things you can do then there was going to be the trainings that would happen and some of the sort of build up and scale up of having an actual midwifery led ward which was funded um, and would bring in the resources so I think that um, like we saw one of the thing key uh, sort of feedback that we had received was if only you gave us the type of beds that would be helpful to provide this care and then the midwifery led ward was initiated that brought those kind of beds so we're hoping that that kind of builds on the momentum despite that this was a short-term project and that I think that would have been part of 
the reasoning and the planning in terms of including a facility like that one where you still have some engagement and some plans beyond a small project. Um, and I think that's sort of what we could do um, given, given the scope of our, of our work at the time. In terms of the needs assessment, I think, um, yes, and in a, in a certain, certain way, I think that in part of engaging, part of, uh, again, engaging the district hospital in terms of where would this kind of intervention be helpful, what, again, it also feeds into the issues of how do we select the facility, it was discussing at the district level where this would be helpful, what kind of interventions could be helpful, and then um, going to the facility. Um, in the model, because it was also a short period of time, and so um, it was it was more of these are some of the interventions that need that could be um, introduced. And then we did an assessment of how far those inter interventions were being implemented. So that's those that pre assessment. So it wasn't necessarily like we went before and then found like these are the things that are missing and then came back. We had interventions that were already predetermined and then we just did an assessment of how far. So that's why you saw that what we discovered was that flexible sacrum positions were not happening, but that the other two were actually being implemented just incorrectly. So it was more of that sort of where we found, it, it, our starting point was already knowing what interventions were possible and then trying to understand to what degree those were being implemented at the facility. And then as you saw in the chart, it sort of rose and I think it would be helpful as you flagged, try and figure out how far that has maintained the momentum throughout P post our intervention and through into the midwifery led model um, ward intervention. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I have a question for you, Dr. Bridget. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, one thing that I, I wanted to say to everybody was uh, the first presentation that I heard you do, you talked about how um, a group of you and your colleagues did some activism um, in Malawi, uh, specifically supporting the rights of women to live in safety and speaking out against violence against women. And that was one of the things that really, really impressed me, the, the fact that you do this activist work. And so in, in the light of that, um, that, that kind of work that you do, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the elements of respectful maternity care that you were talking about. And what is the status of women in your society? And how do the elements of respectful maternity maternity care come into that, particularly for women who might live in poverty or women who might be marginalized by in some other ways. Um, in many in in many healthcare systems, we see the tragedy of violence against women, even within maternity care, that some women are beaten during maternity care. Um, and this this is a this obviously has a very negative impact on mental health outcomes, but on outcomes in general. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about about that. And then if you have time, my second question is um, to ask about, um, is there a big move in Malawi to towards facility uh, led births? And, uh, and what are the percentage of facility led births with, versus births at home? And are the births at home led by midwives as well? Or, or are they um, with um, uh, 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 birth attendants of some kind? Or who's if they are at home, who's there with, with the woman, if anybody's there? So I'll mix the two questions because they're quite related um, and I'll start with providing that actually. Um, so there's a policy in Malawi that has banned the use of traditional birth attendants um, and so majority of um, of deliveries currently are being promoted to happen at the facility. Also, as part of our reducing maternal mortality rate, rates, um, our maternal mortality rates have reduced. They were as high as 1,180 um, around the 2000 period uh, per 100,000 live births. They're now coming down. I think the last estimates have come down to around 300 and something. Still, still, still high. Um, but there's been a lot of interventions of um, trying to reduce reduce sort of um, delays. And I think part of the reason for preventing um, home births was because of delays of, you know, the sort of the delays that we hear about, the delay to seek care, the delay to, 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 to get from one facility to the other. And often with the traditional birth attendants, despite initially having those kind of trainings um, about, um, you know, when to, you know, which danger signs and when to refer. Sometimes we, I think they were seeing that they were still holding them back before they referred them. So I, I think it was a blanket one, which hopefully over time, I know that there's obviously a movement towards providing women. Again, what we're trying to do is provide women all the options that are 
feasible for them. So that's part of, you know, hopefully as our numbers become less and become a bit better, um, we'll be um, we're doing better. A lot of women now, there's a number of places that have waiting homes. Those have their own challenges. So it's still a work in progress. I think that, you know, if you're a woman and you're pregnant, you're high risk, you, for example, if you're a twin delivery, you have to be at the health facility, like, you know, at six months onwards. So that's three months of your life at a, at a waiting home. It's not, you know, it's, it's not easy. Um, so those are some of the challenges that women face. Um, and what we were hearing and the reason why the respectful maternity care model, all the issues that you're flagging were also predominant here in our setting. Um, you know, I think that we were, we have high numbers of deliveries. We have huge staff shortages. I think I often share that, you know, our the last data that was coming out about five years ago was that we had 52 percent um we had a 47 40, 48 percent vacancy rate meaning that um for every you know for every job there was one person that was missing and i think this office often then plays out we know in these labor wards for example this labor ward with 15 deliveries in 24 hours um if you're like one lab one midwife you might be stretched and you know you might you know so but you know, so those were some of the realities of the environment that we don't want to ignore in terms of why sometimes our labor was were not as conducive. But still, I think there was a way of like, despite our resource constraints, despite our challenges, is there a way of being able to provide respectful care? And I think this is a huge movement that's been happening across both midwives and and um, and doctors and clinicians because there wasn't that kind of. I think it was sort of. Um, tough love and really even parents and mothers um, and aunties were really negative towards women delivering. And so there is a move towards becoming more respectful and caring during the labor and delivery process. And partly because we saw that when the move to try and get women to deliver in facilities was, was being promoted, women said, we're not treated nicely. When I'm at the traditional birth attendance, I'm cared for nicely, I'm, I'm given better care, I'm respected. And so part of this is also trying to show that even in the facility, they can provide that kind of care because it was not it was lacking um, and something that women were then not wanting to come to the facility because they were not coming to get the kind of care they, they, they would have desired. So it's I, there's a lot of movement towards that and it's heavily integrated in both medical and nursing care treat, um, curriculums now and in terms of follow-up and in terms of even the some of the indicators in terms of making sure and I think um, we're coming becoming more of a also like a, a leg, um, you know sort of lit, litigious kind of society so I think a lot of those lawsuits have also um, come to play in terms of how much what people can and should do and it, it, you know I think it's Overall, it's, going, it's becoming better, but it's still a work in progress um, overall, yeah. Wow, thank you so much. Yeah, so much work left to do. I can't believe there's a vacancy rate that's that high. That is shocking. Yeah, and yeah, it's, um, I think um, obviously with COVID it was worse. Um, <laughs> I think I was, looks like uh, uh oh there she's back um here let's get you to unmute here one second you just have to unmute oh yes oh sorry there we go. sorry Perfect. About that. so you we, you cut out so we missed your answer oh yeah, yeah sure um now saying that i was often sharing that um when when i was when it, to make it easy i was always saying that you know if we were meant to have 10 people in the ward we only had five when it came to covid um then you take three of those out to do covid you know, sort of ward work, and then you have two people trying to run that ward. So that's that's the reality of how our our health sector has been functioning. Um, so it was really tough um, during the COVID era. Um, but hope right now we, yeah, I guess the numbers are lower. We we have some cases, but at least it's a bit better. Um, and there's a lot of heavy investment into human resource development. Wow, that's amazing. Well, um, I just wanted to welcome all the people who came, especially some of the new people. Um, Dr. Farid Abu Bakr, who I <clears throat> just invited a couple of days ago. It's just such a delight to have you here. And Dr. Um, Maria Brito and Dr. Ivan Sisa from Ecuador. Um, yes, yeah, so welcome. Would you like to say anything, um, Dr. Farid, Dr. Maria, Dr. Ivan? Thank you very much for having me. I mean, this uh, 
this is a very unique uh, project that you just saw. There are some areas where uh, actually in Ethiopia where there is some overlap, but I feel like there is a lot to be learned from, especially the, the human resource issues and how the pandemic you know, made things even worse. So I think there is a lot to be uh, learned from that. Thank you for having me. Mm. Over to you. Mm, thank you so much for joining. And I think it's always so powerful when um, projects and good examples of work that's being done in a setting that's similar. Like I, I know Ethiopia and Malawi are really, really different, but at least they're on the same continent. Um, so there's some sh good sharing that can happen there. Yeah. And um, Dr. Maria, um, uh, would you like to say anything before we before we sign out? Hey, Farhan, uh, nice to meet you with everybody. I just wanted to thank you for these uh, learning spaces. Um, I come from a different background. I'm the, the, the behavioral girl. <laughs> I do promotional campaigns and everything. So I love to work in this multidisciplinary world. So thank you very much for including me in these spaces and with uh, so many people from different parts of the world. Yes, it's wonderful. Thank you very wonderful much. Have you here. Muchas gracias, amiga. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Emily, um, perhaps it's a good time to, to say goodbye. And again, just to let everybody know, we'd love to have you back. We do these webinars every every two months. Um, they're free, available to everybody. And if you just get your name, if you send us your email and your WhatsApp, we can keep in touch with you um, for for the webinars. Yeah. Yeah, I believe our next one is going to be um, is September, I want to say it's September 20, 20th. Um, and that may be 21st in some areas of the world, but uh, that, that should be our next one. Um, and yes, we'd really love to, uh, to hear from everybody and to, to see everybody again. And if there was anything you specifically wanted to share a project you were doing, um, feel free to reach out because this is really a sharing space. Um, we really, the whole point of this is collaboration and learning from each other and growing all together. So please do stay uh, in contact. Um, I'd like to say a few quick thank yous. So first, thank you so much, Dr. Maloesi, Dr. Bridget, <laughs> all the so many ways to say it. Uh, we really appreciate it. I know you, you were traveling today and, uh, and you still managed to make it out. And um, we really appreciate all the time you have taken preparing this and sharing this for all of us. Uh, it really is very inspiring. Um, also want to say thank you to uh, Healthy Seminars who give this space in order for us to do these these webinars and lectures so thank you to them and parisa for um for helping all of the organization is wonderful um so yes thank you to everybody who showed up everybody who who shared and um contributed their thoughts on this and we really look forward to seeing you all again um we hope you have a wonderful rest of of your July and um, and summer for some and, and fall for others. All right, take care, everybody.